Well, good morning. It's good to see each of you here this morning. I'm glad you come to join us as we gather together to worship. Give God the praise that only he is, is worthy of. If you're a guest with us today, we're really honored that you've chosen to be with us and hope that you're going to be blessed from the time that we spend together this morning. But most of all, we want to go ahead and get after what we're here for, which is giving God the glory. And so I'm going to get out of the way. And Tammy, go ahead and lead us out. Good, good morning, everybody. Um, if you would like to look at the words in the book, it is page 499 and 104. And if you feel like standing, go ahead and stand.
seated as we come to this time as we gather together as our church family to pray one for another i invite you if you'd like to come and join me at the altar this morning as we lift those up in prayer holy spirit rain down rain down oh comforter and friend how we need your touch again Holy Spirit, rain down, rain down. Let your power fall, let your voice be heard. Come and change our hearts as we stand on your word. Holy Spirit, rain down. Let me put a couple of names in front of you for your personal prayer time as we pray this morning. Continue to remember Jane Gray and my wife Kathy, and Kathy Pope, uh, David and Kathy Parnell, Harry and Debbie Oswald. And we also want to remember our men. Most of them are on the way back home from the retreat as we are meeting together this morning for their safety as they return to us. I also want to pray Gary Byerly in your uh, prayers. He and a, a team will be leaving very early in the morning on Tuesday heading to Idaho, right? And uh, they're going to be doing some work up there with a church plant and helping to provide for those that are going to come and serve up there. So we're looking forward to that and be praying for their safety as they travel. Also remember Gwen Gooch uh, and keep her in your prayers. Also keep in mind those of our church family that are, that are homebound, uh, those that have what we call the silent illnesses where they are, are, are at home and not able to go anywhere and do anything. They could use a touch from your hand and for your voice. Let's go to the Lord and pray. Father, we thank you so much for loving us and caring for us. We thank you for the privilege of prayer as we come before your throne of grace. And we lift up these names that we shared with you, Father, and we know there are many, many others. Those that are facing medical challenges, those that are facing relationship challenges within their families, those that are having difficulties at workplaces and all sorts of different problems that come our way, Lord. We know that you are the physician, the healer, the comforter, the restorer of our souls, and most of all, Lord, we know that you love us. And we're so grateful for all that you do for us. Forgive us when we take it for granted, Father. But we pray for these, and we pray for our church family as a whole, that we might be strong, that we might be what you've called us to be, that you might glorify yourself through the things that we do that you have told us to do. We pray for our nation. We pray for our leaders. We pray for upcoming elections, Lord. We pray for your will to be done. We pray, Lord, that... Uh, that we would accept our responsibility to participate in the process. But Lord, most of all, that we might seek your guidance in all that we do. Lord, I pray for situations around the world right now. There's so much going on that is you know, so much violence, so much war that is taking place. We know, Lord, that you told us in Scripture to expect this, but it always catches us off guard. We pray for those in the military who protect us on a regular basis and for our first responders here at home looking out after us and for our needs. And Father, as we look at your word this morning, as we focus on what you would have us to say and see, I pray, Lord, that you might open our eyes in a better way than maybe ever before. 
so we might understand, that we might apply your teaching to our lives so that everything that we do will glorify you. Pour your Holy Spirit out upon this time, Lord. And we pray, Lord, that we might just live lives that are worthy of the calling you've placed upon us. And we ask all this in your precious name. Amen. If you'd like to stand and praise the Lord with some more songs. Sing to
All the kids can go to Children's Church right now. Our scripture this morning comes from the book of Mark, the 14th chapter. Mark chapter 14, and we'll begin reading at the 66th verse. One of the long chapters. Mark chapter 14, beginning in, with verse 66. Would you stand with me in honor of reading God's word? And it begins like this. While Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came by. And when she saw Peter warming himself, she looked closely at him. You also were with the Nazarene Jesus, she said. But he denied it. I don't know or understand what you're talking about. And he, went, he said and went out into the entryway. And then the servant girl saw him there and she said again to those standing around, This fellow is one of them. And again he denied it. After a little while, those standing near said to Peter, Surely you're one of them, for you're a Galilean. And he began to call down curses, and he swore to them, I don't know this man that you're talking about. And immediately the rooster crowed the second time. Then Peter remembered the words Jesus had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows twice, you will disown me three times. And he broke down and wept. Thank you. You may be seated. I want to ask you a question this morning, and I want you to think about it carefully. I don't want you to answer it out loud. I won't put you on the spot. Are you embarrassed of Jesus? Are you embarrassed of Jesus? I mean, we all love Jesus. We all say we love Jesus when there's no cost involved. It's easy to love him when there's no pressure placed on us. But as the costs increase, so does the likelihood that we are embarrassed of him. I mean, what do you mean cost, Wally? What are you talking about? Well, it could be physical danger, such as Peter was experiencing being part of a hostile crowd. But, but it could be a case where you might, uh, you might lose a job because of your faith. You might harm a relationship with a friend because of it or or you might have some sort of financial issue come up or affect your social standing could be embarrassment even with your friends over what your beliefs are 
I mean, it's, it tends to spike in our relation. Look at, let's look back again at these verses at what Peter uh, happened to him and how the, how the cost spiked as the time went on. If you go back to uh, chapter four, that same chapter 14 and you read beginning in verse 27, it says this, You will all fall away, Jesus told them, for it's written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I've risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. And Peter declared, even if all fall away, I will not. But truly, I tell you, Jesus answered, today, yes, tonight, before the rooster crows twice, you yourself will disown me three times. But Peter insisted emphatically, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the others said the same. So it was easy for him to say that because what? He was surrounded by disciples. There was no enemy whatsoever to confront him. But go just a, a few verses down further to the 50th verse. And we read, then everyone deserted him and fled. <laughs> they all deserted, but they fled. They didn't deny him. They didn't deny Jesus was the Christ, but they deserted him and went away. And then if you go to back to verse 67, which is someone that we read just a minute ago, it says, when she saw Peter warming himself, she looked closely at him and said, you were with that Nazarene, and he denied it. And what did he do? He walked away. One accuser, and he walks away. So the question I have to you this morning is this. When is Jesus too expensive for you? When is the cost too high? You might say, well, I've never done anything like Peter and publicly yelled, I don't know the man. Never done anything like that. That's probably true, but there are other ways, other ways in our day-to-day -day life that we have decided that standing for Jesus is not worth the cost to us personally. I want to show you that five examples of Scripture of times when we face this question because it's the power of God for, for the weakest, to, you know, it's the power of God within us that allows us to stand. So these five examples, we're going to start with the weakest example, in other words, the least amount of cost, and we're going to gradually go up until the highest amount of cost. So this is the thing. First of all, do you publicly acknowledge and uh, proudly and publicly that you're a Christian? Do you proudly, publicly acknowledge that? Romans 1.16 says, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew and then for the Gentiles. I believe one of the issues we have is too many today seem to think that there's such a thing as a private faith. You ever heard anybody say, well, my faith is between me and God, you know? God never mentions anything about a private faith. We think we can just keep our faith between us and God and, and not use it involved in any other way in our lifetime. And you know, we keep it private in kind of subtle ways. You know, we, we, we never bring up anything in a conversation about the Bible or, or about our faith. Or we never mention the fact that we go to church. Or we might never mention the fact that we ever pray for someone. You see, the, the aspects of your life that mean something to you are going to work their way into your conversation. Okay, most of you now have known me for nearly 12 years. And if you were to say things that come into my conversation probably way too many times, is you know that I used to have a garden, you know, a large garden that worked me to death. Had more peanuts than I ever knew what to do with because Don planted me more peanuts than I could ever figure out what to do with, Miss Early. You know, I'd say, what were you doing? But they were good. You also know that for years I was a first responder. You know that I like to hunt and I like to fish. You know those things about me simply because they enter into my conversation probably more times than they should. Those things that are important to you in your life will work their way into your conversation because they are important to you. So if we say that Jesus is important to us, but he never comes up in our conversation, then what does that really say about how important our faith is to us? If somebody went around to your friends and neighbors and asked, is so-and-so is a Christian? Would the answer be, I, I, I think so. 
or, or maybe, or would it be absolutely? You know, if we're, we're directly asked about our relationship to, to, to God, uh, we, uh, we would say that we are, but that's not what I'm talking about. I think too often Christians conspire to keep our faith tucked away like our driver's license. I mean, you're not always flipping your driver's license out. If you want to see my driver's license, if you ask me about it, I'll take it out with some effort, getting it out of my wallet, but I'll show it to you. Hopefully you're not wearing a badge when that time comes. But see, the thing about it is we want to keep our relationship with Christ private. But Romans 1.18 says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Are you? Are you? Let's, let's go up a notch, okay? In worship, do I focus on what other people think? Do I focus on what other people think? John 4, 24 says, God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. So when we are worshiping, we're supposed to be focusing on God and on Jesus. But I wonder if sometimes we're more concerned about that person sitting beside us or behind us or in front of us and what they think. Maybe you feel led to say amen because of your several tongued pastor. At some point, he brings a cross in them and a message, but, but your friend's sitting, you wonder what that person sitting next to you is going to think. Or maybe we feel that we should go forward and come to the altar during prayer time, but you wonder about who's going to sit there and say, well, what are they having to come down and pray about? You know, we're more concerned about what other people are thinking. Maybe we feel like we, we, we want to raise hands and praise when we're singing and, and the words really hit us home and it touched our hearts, but, but we don't want anyone to think that we're some sort of religious fanatic or just doing it for show. So we're more concerned about what the people around us are thinking. Maybe we're moved by the message and we want to shed a tear, but we're too embarrassed to do that. What is the common thread? We are more focused on what the persons around us is thinking rather than what Jesus is thinking. Jesus calls us to praise and honor him. Of course, no one should force worship that's not genuine. Now, I'm not saying you go through all sorts of emotions because people think you are you know, really worshiping because that's just the same thing as what we're talking about, being worried about what another person thinks. But we are called to worship him. We often we're too embarrassed to do that. And you know what's odd about that? Think about where we are. We are sitting in a, a sanctuary surrounded mostly by believers. And if there's any place that we should not be embarrassed of Jesus, it should be in this group of people. We should never feel that way here in church. If we're embarrassed of Jesus in this low threat environment that we're sitting in right now, how likely are we to be proud of our faith when we walk out into the world? Let's turn up the pressure again. In public, do I stand for the publicly acceptable parts of the gospel? Matthew 5, 29 and verse 30 says this, if your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go to hell. Now, there are parts of our Christian belief that are pretty much things that everyone, whether they're a believer or not, will ascribe to. God is love. We should love our neighbor God will forgive you if you ask for forgiveness. Those are the, what we call the warm and fuzzy teachings of the Bible. Those that are easy, that aspect of the Christian faith. Even those that are not Christians would not have a problem with those. But then there are those parts that not everyone is so crazy about. For example, there's a place called hell. God wants you to get rid of the sin in your life. Sex outside of marriage is wrong, and on and on and on. This week I was killing some time, and so I was looking at BuzzFeed. You know, I get 
I laugh sometimes of the, the surveys that they do sometimes and what people have to say. And there was one on there in the last couple of days, maybe, I think it may have been yesterday, a listing about, I think it was 25 different people telling why they no longer ascribed to the Christian faith and did not go to church. They were no longer believers. Well, the one thing that became clear as I read those things down there after I'm sitting there shaking my head while I'm reading it is that there's really a doubt whether these people were ever Christians in the first place. But they were more concerned with the Bible agreeing with their beliefs rather than them agreeing with the scriptural beliefs. Every one of them had something that scripture says that they didn't like because it went against their lifestyle, they went against their behavior, or it told them, no, 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 that you should not do that. I mean, none of us likes to be told no. And these people confronted with their sin decided that it was Christianity's fault, not theirs. There are beliefs that not everybody likes and some would find offenses. And so those, they are less likely to be publicly embraced. Does that sound like something new to you? When you stand for the truths of God, when you stand on the word of God, do you only stand for the parts that everyone agrees are great? I'm afraid way too many of us do. In this society today, we find ourselves afraid of public opinion. When a subject comes up at work or, or in, a, in, a, in a, a relaxed atmosphere, you know, when you're among friends and, and it touches on one of those less warm and fuzzy teachings of Scripture, are you silent? Are, are you embarrassed of what Jesus said is true on a particular issue? And so you choose not to say anything? Do we only stand on the publicly acceptable part of gospel? Or do we stand on the truth? I've told you more and more times than you probably cared to hear that as long as we stand on the word of God, then we stand on a strong platform. Not on my opinion or your opinion, but on what God's word said. Do you stand on the entire word of God? Let's turn it up another notch. What if in one of my relationships, will I speak the truth even if it might hurt that friendship? Would I speak the truth even if it might hurt that friendship? Ephesians 4.15 said, Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is, Christ. Now this idea is so uncomfortable for some of us that we choose not to do it. We choose not to confront someone who is doing something that is anti-scriptural. But we, we realize that we really don't have that choice. Because in doing so, we have chosen to ignore something that God has told us to do. And if we expect God's blessing, we have to follow the teachings of Scripture. And now let me, let me put a caveat in that, if that's the correct word to use. We need to be careful in discerning what God is leading us to do when it comes to confronting someone about what's going on in their lives. Confrontation has to be done in love. I was talking with someone this morning, just for worship service, about issues within a family and confrontations that were taking place, but they're stri striving to make those confrontations done in love, not as judgment, but in love to correct something going on in someone's life. But see, there's issues. The issues are, we don't like confrontation. I don't like confrontation. I would love for everything to go along smoothly and for me never to have to confront anybody about anything. Sadly, that didn't come with the responsibilities of being a Christian. Secondly, we don't want anybody to be mad at us. Nobody wants people to be mad at them. Everybody wants to be liked and loved be popular and be friendly, then sometimes these sort of confrontations are handled in an offensive way. But perhaps the biggest problem with this is that we are embarrassed to do what Jesus has told us to do. 
What does that tell us about our relationship with Christ? If we're embarrassed to do what he has told us to do. I don't just, I don't just, I just don't want to stand in obedience to Christ when it gets uncomfortable. You know, that's, that's what people would say. If it gets uncomfortable, then I, I don't have to do what Christ wants me to do. I mean, there are times when confronting somebody over a spiritual issue or in their lives can be received poorly and hurt the friendship. That's true. But if we choose to ignore the command of Jesus and the leading of the Holy Spirit to deal with the issue is to put Jesus second over our own desires and our own thoughts. Now, once again, we have to be careful that when we decide to, to, to talk with someone or to confront something, someone about something that is in their life that we think needs to come out of their life, we need to make doggone sure that what we think needs to come out of their life needs to come out of their life because it is not scriptural, not just because we don't like it or we don't like who they are or what they think. We need to make sure that anything that we do when we confront somebody about an, a, 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 an act in their life is that we are responding with the word of God not with my opinion and your opinion because, you know, opinions are like noses. Everybody's got one and they don't all look alike. And so we need to make sure that we can say, thus saith the Lord, not this is what I say, but this saith the Lord. And then let's take it all the way up. Would I tell somebody how to be saved? Would I tell someone how to be saved john 3 8 john 3 begins like this in reply jesus declared i tell you the truth hear this now no one can see the kingdom of god unless he is born again how can a man be born when he is old nicodemus asked surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born and jesus answered i tell you a truth no one can enter the kingdom of god unless he is born of water and the spirit flesh gives birth to flesh but the spirit gives birth to spirit you should not be surprised at my saying you must be born again the wind blows wherever it pleases you hear its sound but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going so it is with everyone born of the spirit so how often do we witness to someone and point them to a relationship with christ when was the last time that you had a chance to lead someone to Christ. When was the last time? I read a survey some time ago that said that basically in the average church, only 1% of the church membership will ever physically lead someone to a relationship with Christ. 1%. It's scary in a lot of ways to ask someone if they know Jesus. Some people might get angry. Some may, may ask uh, out if, uh, at the implication that there's something wrong with her or something that they need to complete their life. Some may ask questions that you don't know the answer to. And some might mock your belief. And so many of us just choose to avoid it. Even if there is an open door in that direction, we choose to step away from it. So in the end... We are embarrassed of Jesus and the salvation he offers. I mean, you'll tell somebody about this book you're reading. Great book. You'll tell somebody about this great podcast that you listen to. You know, or, or television show that you see it or, or a movie. We'll tell somebody about what we think is the best place to eat in town. And, and if you want to go uh, on a vacation, we'll tell you where you think is the best place to stay whatsoever. But what we won't do is talk about what Jesus can do. We need to, what would you do with a divine appointment? See, whenever you have the opportunity to come into an open conversation with somebody about their relationship with Christ, when the door opens for you to enter into that conversation, that is what I call a divine appointment. God has put the two of you together at that place in time so that you might share with them the saving blood of Jesus Christ. And too often we walk away from it. What is your level of comfort with your relationship with Jesus? 
Can you overcome that escalating pressure? Let's look at it again. Back in Mark 14. It says, when she saw Peter warming himself, she looked closely at him. You also were with the Nazarene Jesus, she said, but he denied it. I don't know or understand what you're talking about, he said, and went off into the entryway. So one girl, and he denies it and walks away. And then the second confrontation is Mark, just a few verses later, it says, when the servant girl saw him there, she said again to those who standing around, this fellow is one of them. Again, he denied it. It's the same girl. He still vaguely denies it, but he doesn't walk away. And then the third confrontation. After a little while, those standing near to Peter said, Surely you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. And he began to call down curses upon himself, and he swore to them, I don't know this man you're talking about. And now he boldly and profanely denies that he knows Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. Now rest assured, our denial of Christ is not always a Peter moment. But those small, quiet moments with relatively small consequences. But you see, it doesn't make any difference whether it's a Peter moment or if it's one of those small, quiet moments where we back away from what God's relationship to us should be. It's the same thing. Just like Scripture tells us, a sin is a sin is a sin. A denial is is a denial, is a denial. We have to be on our toes because we don't ever know when that temptation is going to come. It may come sometime when we are, are, are riding a spiritual high. It may come at a time when it is the darkest moment in our life. There are all sorts of things going on when we don't see what's happening. But look at the life of Elijah. We talk about Elijah, about how powerful he was, you know, because Elijah faced down 850 Baal prophets in a challenge that was just, would have blown everybody away that had been there to see. I wish I could have seen that when the fire came down from heaven and consumed that altar. Right in front of all those 850 prophets, but just a few days later, he was afraid of one woman. One woman. He ran and hid. Because he didn't think God would get him through that either. If you're a child of God, then be proud of it. Because you have life. And life eternity. Don't let your testimony become, do I know him? Well, yes, sort of. It's it's a distant relationship, but I kind of know him. I've mentioned this before, but my one fault with Ronald Reagan when he was president and when he was running for president, he did an interview on national television, you know, and in that conversation, now this is when, this is when the term born again became, you know, uh, something that occurred all the time. And the, and the interview asked him, he him, he said, are you born again? And his response was, I like to think so. And I'm sitting there saying, no, 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 no. I was screaming at the television. That is not the correct answer. You either know or you don't. There's no thinking involved in it. You either are or you aren't. There's no middle ground. No in between. Or is your testimony, I'm a child of God. I'm a follower of Jesus. And I am proud of having him in my life. So I ask you again, are you embarrassed of Jesus? I have a twofold invitation to you this morning. The first part is to those of you who are believers. Satan has convinced humanity, all of humanity, that the key to true happiness is whatever you want it to be. Whatever you want it to be. If it feels good, if it gets you attention, go for it. All you have to do is walk down a, a, a public, uh, uh, someplace where the public is gathering. I mean, you know, a couple of weekends ago, you know, Kathy and I slipped away for a couple of days to get a little mental rehab at the beaches in Jacksonville. Little did we know that just 100 feet down from our hotel there on the beach was their annual Oktoberfest expecting some 45,000 people to show up. 
And we slept to the rhythm all night long. Boom, 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 boom. It was just going on like crazy. We didn't go. We walked by there one time. And I was done because this big man came walking out of one of the public restrooms there. And he had this contraption on the top of his head that looked like it was made out of tinfoil but had been rolled into tubes and it kind of went all over the place, you know, attaching to his head and all backwards like that. And I know that my jaw hit the ground right in front of me. He was nice. He said, hi, how are you doing? He talked to me there and I wanted to say, are you okay or do I need to call the sanity police, you know? And I saw things on that, I saw things there that just blew my mind. It's almost like you can't walk down the beach because it's pornographic anymore with what people are wearing. Because people do what they want to do and they think it makes it right. They look at Christianity as just a moral killjoy because it challenges the my in my life. Because that's what people are thinking today. The only thing that's important is me, myself, and I. And what I want is just fine with me. My desires, my body, my mind, my choice. So what do your actions as a believer show? Have you allowed public opinion and the desire not to offend anyone to dilute your witness? It's time like never before to be sold out all in in our relationship with Christ. We are God's family. There are no secret meetings. There are no code words. There are no secret handshakes and subtle actions. We are to be bold in the service of our Lord and for our witness and our voice when we tell people that I have eternal life through the blood of Jesus Christ and you too can have it. We cannot be weak. We have to go all in and shine like stars in a dark and ever darkening world. We are the only hope because we are this world's only connection to Jesus. And if we don't do what we're supposed to do, I don't even want to think about consequences for this world. We should not ever think that anything is too expensive. We should be willing to give it all because Jesus did. Now, there are those you hear this morning that are not believers. You have never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. God so loved the world. It didn't say that God so loved these people and these people and these people. It didn't say that God loved the people who acted this way or God that didn't do this or didn't do this. It said God so loved the world whosoever whosoever means all inclusive whosoever whosoever it doesn't matter what you have done or what you are involved in right now you are not beyond the reach of the love of Jesus Christ he has been and is still calling your name saying come home you say, well, Wally, I'm not, I'm not sure I can change. I'm not sure I can change. Let me tell you, I agree with you. You cannot. You cannot change. But he can change you. He can transform you into what he wants you to be, to make you new, to cleanse the old and remold the new. The old hymn says, just as I am without one plea. It doesn't say, just a moment, Lord, I've got to clean it up first. Just as I am without one plea. God will do the rest. All you have to do is take the first step. And I challenge you to do that today. Because today, you will make a decision. And if you don't belong to, belong to Jesus, you will make a devastating decision. Because you're either going to say yes or you're going to say no. There's not a maybe. There's not a later. There's not I'll think about it. You know, if you walk out the door without Christ, you have said no. And you don't know whether you'll have another opportunity. 
I say that, and I say that strongly, because I don't want to see anyone, anyone, leave this world without Christ. Are you embarrassed of Jesus? Then let's make it right today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you, Lord, that even though sometimes we don't want to hear it, the words can be tough and they can be difficult. And they can require us to be strong. But, Lord, we don't have to be strong because we can rely on your strength because you promised that to us. And so as we walk through our lives, I pray that you will lead us, guide us, and direct us to be bold, to be strong, to be open, and be willing to share Jesus every chance we get. And for those here this morning that don't know you, Lord, just tap them on the shoulder this morning. Call them home. And we ask this in your precious name. Amen. Amen. Everyone would just please stand. Just as I Let us pray. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you and we just ask, ask you to be with us as we go through this new week. And may we be a blessing to you and we just give you all the honor and glory and just, uh, just bless this offering and bless the givers. In Jesus Christ's name I pray these things. Amen.
Let me just remind you of a couple of announcements you need to make. I'm not going to read you the whole bulletin because you're all adults and I'm fairly certain you can handle that. If you just take it home and nail it to your refrigerator door and it reminds you everything's going up. But that being said, October is a crazy month for us here at, at Thomas, I mean, Thomas Ray, at Mount Olive Baptist Church from there. You want to say something, George? <laughs> I want to thank God for Mary. Uh huh. Well, good, Mary. <laughs> and, and Mary, we appreciate you putting up with George, you know, from there. <laughs> but there are a couple of things that I would like to say, and I want to point out to you in a month. Don't forget, it all begins about the 26th when we uh, have our uh, fall festival. Uh, and I, I, I mentioned, I, I noticed when I looked at the, the hot dog eating contest sign up sheet out there. Ladies, you're not holding up your end of the bargain here. There are no ladies' names on that, that sheet. And I've seen some of you eat, so I think maybe you can get involved with this if you want to. And you can, you can put it down from there. I'll pay for that at some point in time in the future, I promise. Uh, but also, that's coming up. Uh, a lot of things, if you haven't signed up for a place, there are places, you, there's still places you can sign up to participate uh, and help make this go. This is a tremendous community event. It's not uncommon for us to have over 400 people here on that night uh, through our gates, people that we may never see again, but we have the opportunity to make contact with and minister to. Also, the candy box is out there, uh, and if you haven't uh, thrown a bag in there, feel free to do so because there's never enough candy uh, from there. Uh, so we want to do that. Homecoming's coming up the following Sunday. Uh, Brian Free and Assurance will be here in the morning worship service, and it'll be an early exciting day. Uh, many of you have, 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 as with me have heard them before, and it will really be blessed in the time that we get there. And plus, we also get to eat together afterwards, uh, and that's going to be exciting that we can do that. Also coming up is the Senior Luncheon. Uh, is on October the 28th, that's on Friday, October the 28th, at the Sakura Buffet over in the mall in uh, Lake City at 1230. Uh, and so that's going to be a lot of fun too. Uh, one of my favorite places to eat there because I like their hot and sour soup. Uh, also, next Sunday morning uh, during our worship service, we're going to have some special speakers with us, uh, some missionary friends uh, of Damon's. Uh, uh, Bryson and Jolene English, are they're preparing to go to be missionaries in Japan, and they're going to come and share with us, you know, what's going on uh, in their lives and the opportunities that they're going to have uh, as uh, time passes by to take Christ into that country. Uh, and we're looking forward to hearing from them. That's next Sunday uh, as well. Men, don't forget prayer breakfast coming this Thursday morning. And uh, we're looking forward to seeing you there as we gather at the Dixie Grill for breakfast fellowship uh, and uh, prayer time together. Uh, I hope you'll come back and join us tonight. We continue our Sunday night study in the book of Job. Uh, and we've been in, in, I would say we've been enjoying that. But sometimes the book of Job is not something that you enjoy because we learned some hard lessons uh, through that. But we're looking forward to that as we go that tonight. I look forward to seeing you. Uh, so I'm going to pray for us and then we're going to have a closing hymn and I hope you have a great afternoon. Father, we love you and we thank you so much because I know you were here this morning. And we pray that our lives will give you glory and honor in everything that we do. And Lord, we, we don't only ever be embarrassed about you. Give us strength and courage to shine like stars everywhere that we go. And we ask this in your precious name. Amen. All right, if you'll stand and sing.